How did the first Starship Super Heavy test go? What are the steps towards the first orbital Starship launch? And what is Terran R, Relativity Space's fully reusable heavy lift rocket? Let's find out. What about it? Go for launch. We're go for launch. Let's light this candle. Ignition sequence start. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It? And as always, there's been a lot going on in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. Starship Updates And we're back with another exciting journey to Starbase, Texas, where Elon Musk and his team are building a stainless steel vision of our spacefaring future. Let's start with the big news. Super Heavy BN 2.1, the first ever Super Heavy test article, has successfully been tested at the SpaceX South Texas Starship launch site. As predicted in the last episode, the SpaceX crew didn't waste time at all and did a first cryogenic proof test in the evening of June 8th after the rollout only a few days earlier on June 3rd. BN 2.1, as signaled by the Point 1, is not a full booster yet. It's a test tank, featuring a complete engine mount, but just a small tank on top. SpaceX has been using these kinds of test articles before. Whenever a design needs a proof test first, SpaceX builds one of these. Often directly followed by an actual test candidate, these smaller test tanks are an important step in the development process. And a cryogenic proof test, for those who do not know, means that the tank is flooded with cryogenic liquid. In this case, nitrogen is used as it is an inert gas. It cannot burn and it's slow to react with any other substances. It makes these tests much safer for everyone involved. It is cooled to the point at which it condenses and turns into a cryogenic liquid. SpaceX then fills it into the test tank to simulate a fueling process. Pressure is raised to a level similar to what a super heavy tank would experience during a flight to test integrity and to get first data on how the tank behaves. As of recording this episode, there was no official news as to the results of this first test, but it did seem to go very well. Next up, we have the orbital launch site, which is essential for SpaceX right now. If they want to quickly transition into orbital flight tests, they'll need the proper ground equipment to support these flights. As seen through Mauricio's lens, it almost looks insignificant. Built in a remote place of South Texas, directly at the shore of Boca Chica, this place could become one of the most important sites of human history. Zooming in a bit closer on the site, separate buildings and infrastructure become visible. Right now, the place is divided into the following areas. All the way on the right, we have the suborbital pad fuel farm. It's been here for two years now, and it's been heavily used for every test there was so far. All the cryogenic tests in the beginning, before the first hops, were powered by this fuel farm. All the low altitude hops from Starhopper to serial number 6. And of course, all the high altitude test flights too. Up until now, this was the beating heart of the launch site, providing nitrogen for cryogenic tests, methane and oxygen for flights, and water for fire extinguishing systems. It is likely that SpaceX will keep this tank farm for some time as well, as it is useful to have a dedicated testing fuel farm for any test articles that might need testing in the near to midterm future. Just left of the old fuel farm, we have the suborbital test pads A and B. All hops and flights have taken off from here so far. It's likely that SpaceX will soon get rid of at least one of these pads as they will be less and less needed. I still think that SpaceX will get rid of Pad A, the lower one of the two, and erect a building at the spot. The square foundation, the railings surrounding it, and the large ramp leading up to it. This would be a perfect spot for a launch site high bay as soon as less and less test articles are being tested here. In the middle, we have the landing pad, surrounded by a huge blast berm, which is the best proof for SpaceX not intending to change this anytime soon. It's not clear yet if SpaceX will actually keep landing starships on legs, as Musk stated before, that they might as well try and catch them similar to the Super Heavy boosters, but if they stick with legs, we'll likely see a few more starships land here in the future. Then comes the main focus right now, and you can tell by the picture. Almost all the construction at the launch site right now is going on on the left side towards the sea. We have the new orbital fuel farm below, which already looks much better organized than the old one, and above it, the crown jewel, the orbital launch mount and the support tower. SpaceX is making progress here every day right now as if it was a race, and it kind of is. Before this infrastructure is finished, no orbital flight tests can commence. 
And here is the constant progress. SpaceX has repurposed part of the fuel production site at the old gas site next to the Starship construction complex to be able to build ground infrastructure on a fast pace. Ground support tanks for the fuel farm and tower segments for the support tower are being built on a constant basis. Here you can see the recent production from the construction site head out to the launch site in one of Jack Byer's wonderful videos. A new tower segment ready for stacking and one of the new 12 meter diameter water tanks for the new orbital fuel farm. This way SpaceX circumvents a common problem when building such large structures. They don't need to transport the parts to the build site from far away. The short trip down Highway 4 from the construction site to the launch site is carried out with mobile roll lifts. Nice and easy, even though the parts are truly gigantic. And the parts keep on coming. Here you can see another cryogenic shell being stacked for one of the GSE tanks. The site never sleeps and construction is relentlessly being driven forward. A huge thank you goes out to NASA Spaceflight for providing all these pictures. Head on over to their channel for an equally constant supply of pictures and videos directly from these historic construction efforts. Let's not forget, if this all works out, SpaceX right now is building our future in space. In 50 years from now, people will look back at this as a second Apollo era. The moment we reached out into space with a new kind of rocket. A new concept to try and get a foothold in space. But is all this enough to start our advent of a multi-planetary species? Let's find out next. The Y family needs your support. Give the video a like, subscribe and share it with your friends on Twitter or Facebook to show the YouTube algorithm that you appreciate the content. Looking for a more direct way of support? Become a Patreon or YouTube member by clicking the join button right under the video and get some awesome perks. Gain access to our Discord server where you can meet me and the rest of the community or get a completely ad-free release of each and every episode provided just for channel members. Or do you know about the Y Warehouse? Shop for your next Starship shirt, hoodie or cap and look as awesome as you feel. Links can be found in the description, you rock! Terran R, the fully reusable mini Starship. Which brings me directly to today's second topic, Relativity Space and Terran R. On June 8th, there was a big buzz in the tech and space news scene. Relativity Space, a little known company to the casual space fan, released a video on YouTube introducing their next gen rocket. For many, this came out of nowhere. A shiny video presenting an exotic looking rocket that claims to be the next big thing when it comes to heavy lift rockets. A true next-gen project, entirely 3D printed, fully reusable, lots of visual similarities to the SpaceX Starship, organic looking structures, multi-planetary transport capable, 5 meter diameter, 65 meters tall, 9.5 meganewtons of thrust. Wait, what? Where did this come from? Who is behind this and does this have a realistic chance of becoming the heavy lift Starship of the future? Relativity Space, a Los Angeles-based rocket startup, has been around for five years now. Largely avoiding media presence, they've been tinkering behind closed doors on what they believe to be the future of rocket construction. Entirely 3D printed rockets. This way, algorithmically generated structures can be created that are exactly as strong in certain parts as needed. This technology is not new. Bone-like structures have been developed and printed for the automotive sector and for airplanes, for example, and this kind of construction is only possible through 3D printing. Furthermore, Relativity Space can use the same printers for all their developments. Tim Ellis, CEO of Relativity Space, founded the metal printing department at Blue Origin before going on his own adventure with Relativity Space. Relativity Space has two rockets in development right now, Terran-1 and Terran-R. Comparing the two vehicles shows that each is a completely different breed. Terran-1, slated to launch later this year, is expendable, much smaller and designed for small payloads. It currently is 85% printed and the 9 Aeon-1 engines powering it have been extensively tested. The first launch is of pure demonstration nature and will not carry a payload, whereas the second mission, slated for June 2022, will carry CubeSats to LEO as part of NASA's Venture Class Launch Services Demonstration 2 contract. Due to the 3D printing nature of all of the rocket parts used by Relativity Space, they have a huge theoretical advantage. The currently developed ANR engines, which will power the larger Terran R rocket, are printed with the same 3D printers that create the Aeon 1 engines, one of which you can see perform a full duration burn on the Stennis test stand in Mississippi. 
You've heard me say words like NASA contract and Stennis Space Center now. And that brings us to one of the most important aspects of the success chances of Relativity Space. Even though you might not have heard of the company yet, Relativity Space is not so small after all. Backed by the US Air Force and with contracts from NASA and rights of entry and lease facilities at Vandenberg and Cape Canaveral Space Force Station Launch Complex 16, they have big plans. The company recently secured another $650 million in funding and is currently valued at $4.2 billion. A first anchor customer for Terran R, which is supposed to launch for the first time as early as 2024, is already secured as well. Some big players are very interested in building an alternative to SpaceX's established services. And it makes sense too. If all this works out, Terran R will be a Falcon 9 sized Starship equivalent, which is a very attractive launcher concept. Anyone who follows SpaceX closely knows that the rocket industry right now is in a state of disruption. Old Space is building SLS and New Space is smiling while watching Starships being built segment by segment. To have a healthy competition though and to be able to colonize Mars as Elon Musk wants to, there needs to be more than one company working on it. And Relativity Space with their 3D printers and lots of new ideas is exactly what needs to happen many more times. Our future in space cannot be achieved by SpaceX alone. As Tim Ellis puts it, 3D printing is inevitable. If we want to colonize other worlds, these printers are the way to go to manufacture off-world and even in low-G environments. When looking at the Terran R rocket design, one thing becomes obvious quickly. It kind of very much looks like a SpaceX Starship. It's got the booster on the bottom, the second stage is its own vehicle capable of re-entering an atmosphere, it even has the same reusable fairing approach with the clamshell design known from SpaceX's Starships. It runs on methane and oxygen, a gas combination that can be produced on Mars. Relativity Space is preparing for the same kind of tasks and it is using the same kind of design to achieve it, just smaller and fully 3D printed. The organic looking structures built by Relativity Space are nothing new either. Here you can see a NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory project related to interplanetary lander designs. It's called Intuitive AI Design. You give an algorithm the task of building an object that's supposed to do a certain task and withstand certain forces, and the AI then designs an object that exactly fits these parameters. The end result is a 3D printed structure that only has material in places where strength is needed. Similar to a human bone, it is extremely lightweight and at the same time very stiff and strong. It is something a human engineer wouldn't have come up with. While being designed by the AI, the parts run through a process similar to an evolution. Millions of designs are being tested, changed, tested again and all of it virtually and extremely fast. Until after a certain time the part is designed or has grown so to say. These are exactly the innovations we will need if we want to be successful on other planets. Fingers crossed that Relativity Space and many other companies out there find funding and are able to develop their new space ideas so that our advent of multiplanetary species comes fast and with the needed diversity. Welcome again to our little course on how to become a successful artist with Skillshare. This time we're talking style and how to find your own when designing and creating. With a little help from Skillshare and Andy J Pizza, an illustrator, designer and podcaster, you can dive into finding your own vibe. You've heard it said that to be creative is to think outside of the box. Well, Andy thinks it's more about creating your own box and he's right about it. What is style? Do you have to find it or does it come to you after some time? Is it just about the choices you make in your creative work? 12 packed lessons will bring you closer to your personal answer. The first 1000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership and after that it's only around $10 a month. Even if you've already had a free trial of Skillshare, you can still take advantage of this offer to get a full year of unlimited learning and creative exploration. Today's supporter shoutout goes to Rick Fitzgerald, Finn Große Blei, Daniel Beards, Martinis, Nico A and many others. You rock! More than a thousand pages of script, more than 40 hours of content and almost 200,000 subscribers in just over two years. And all of it thanks to all the supporters, all of you. Thank you so much for what you're doing for us and don't forget to jump on our supporter exclusive discord so that I can thank you in person. 
Today's team shoutout goes to Marco Maku for being the youngest member on the team, relentlessly supporting the cause and for taking on a 2000 kilometer trip to join us on the upcoming meetup on June 19th. Marco, you rock. Largely avoiding media presence, they've been think thinkering. <laughs> Relativity space is not so small. Small. <laughs> it is 3D printed. It is likely that SpaceX will keep this tank far. <laughs> small. Launch complex 16. <laughs> Backed by the US Air Force. These are exactly the innovations we will need if we want to finish this script. <laughs> wow, dude, I'm sweating. <laughs> ah, I am sweaty. And I could use one of those 12 diameter water tanks right now. <laughs> it is likely that SpaceX will keep this tank. No been sweating my ass off. All right, let's try this. Shit. <laughs>